My name is Anna Domicek. Uh, I'm editor in chief of Hypertension, and today we're talking about freshly released today uh, American Heart Association statement on resistant hypertension. And I have a pleasure to talk to Dr. Bob Carey, who is the author uh, of the statement. We interested Bob to know uh, for the practicing clinician. What are the new things? How the definition of resistant hypertension has changed for us who see patients in clinics? Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to speak about our new scientific statement on resistant hypertension. Uh, the definition of resistant hypertension has changed since the previous 2008 scientific statement in four ways. The first way is that blood pressure needs to be measured specifically according to the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology 2017 hypertension guideline. And the details are provided in that guideline. Uh, secondly, uh, the patient should be taking at least three antihypertensive agents, commonly a long-acting calcium channel blocker, an inhibitor of the renin angiotensin system, and a diuretic. And all of these should be taken at maximal or maximally tolerated doses. The third way is that um, the definition of resistant hypertension must exclude a white coat effect. And that is when the out of office blood pressure is at target, but the in-office blood pressure is still uh, up. And that requires ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, uh, or if that's not available, home uh, blood pressure monitoring. So uh, practicing physicians uh, need to become familiar with out-of-office blood pressure monitoring to make this diagnosis. And then the final way that the definition is altered uh, is uh, that medication non-adherence needs to be excluded as a reason for resistance. And that's a difficult proposition. It requires uh, a lot of energy on the part and time on the part of the practicing physician to have a conversation with the patient uh, but also um, engage in um, ways of picking up non-adherence to antihypertensive medication. And there are many different ways. There are direct and indirect ways. Uh, and combinations of those ways uh, need to be employed to exclude non-adherence. So once those four conditions are um, followed, and uh, then you can make the diagnosis of resistant hypertension. So once the diagnosis is made, of course, it's very, very imp important how we treat these patients. And I think uh, colleagues who are just about to read the statement haven't yet had the chance, would be interested to know what are the major new improvements in management. So there are two major improvements uh, in the management of hypertension that are emphasized um, in the statement. And the first one is the efficacy of thiazide-like diuretics, which are different from ordinary thiazide diuretics. The thiazide-like diuretics are chlorothaladone and endapamide. And uh, those should be substituted early on after the diagnosis of resistant hypertension they should be substituted for thiazide diuretics such as hydrochlorothiazide. We also have um, a method of determining when loop diuretics are needed uh, in the case of renal insufficiency in a patient with resistant hypertension. So that's the first um, important different step. The second important different step uh, comes from recent studies showing the efficacy of spironolactone or aldactone uh, or a plerinone, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, in uh, the treatment of resistant hypertension. 
and this was shown beautifully in a uh, randomized clinical uh, trial uh, and is um, now well established as uh, the best way to treat resistant hypertension. So that should be added after the chlorothaladone or, or anapamide substitution is made. So many male patients in particular in my practice don't tolerate spironolactone and hate it and hate the doctor who prescribes it <laughs> subsequently. Why not to just go for a pleronone first? Well, you, <clears throat> we did not recommend that because the efficacy of a pleronone is significantly yes. inferior yeah. to spironolactone. But if you have a male patient in particular that's having difficulty uh, with side effects from spironolactone, you can switch to a plerinone uh, and it has to be given twice daily. Uh, and this will um, eliminate uh, the side effects of impotence and gynecomastia in men. Okay, so if we can come back to adherence, once we treat, once we've made the diagnosis, the issue of adherence is still there, not only for the diagnostic phase, but also for being successful over the years of treatment. You mentioned talking to the patient. Uh, we've all tried that, not always works. So how uh, aggressive do you recommend and do the, do the statement recommends to be, does it mean that many, many patients would need to have uh, biochemical, pharmacological tests to see the drug levels? The statement um, recommends an aggressive approach to adherence to assure that the patient is adherent to antihypertensive medication. So interviewing the patient uh, in a non-judgmental way um, because everyone that takes medications occasionally misses and just asking how many times a week uh, does the patient estimate uh, that they have missed it will be one way of doing it. But then there are other ways of doing it. For example, there is a medication event monitoring system yeah. in which the pill box is open and there's an electronic recording of that and that can be brought back and analyzed in a medical office. Um, there are um, also uh, ways of intensifying um, your approach to non-adherence by actually observing uh, the patient taking the medication and then measuring blood pressure after the medication has been absorbed and able to take effect uh, to determine uh, better uh, and more directly um, the uh, presence of non-adherence. And then finally, uh, the best method, um, most reliable method, is by either urine or blood measurement. I favor urine measurement by um, HPLC um, methods. And this is not available everywhere, but it is available in most uh, large medical centers in practically every state in the United States and also uh, abroad in Europe. And so we recommend that. And to put it all together, we really recommend a combination of different ways of assuring adherence. One could never be 100% assured that a patient is adherent, but let's make a good try so that we don't escalate treatment in a patient who is non-adherent mm -hmm. and cause additional medical problems and side effects. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank You're you. welcome.